Good morning. morning. I'm in a quandary, and maybe uh, you can help me. Uh, Next uh, Sunday at the Super Bowl, I do, uh, my team is not playing. And in my closet, I have an Eagles jersey and a Chiefs jersey. I'm not really sure what to do. I mentioned the quandary in the first service, and somebody online that was watching said Chiefs, obviously. And... uh, and after the service uh, uh, was over, after our first service, three uh, three young guys, three little uh, three little dudes, all Chiefs fans, uh, came up to me and said, "We want you to wear the Eagles jersey, since every team you root for loses." And I was like, "You little boogers, you!" I thought that that had been something I would have said back in the day. <laughs> so you just have to come next week and. Uh, see, uh, see how the coin, coin toss is there. John chapter 17 in your Bible. Uh, Jesus has been speaking to his followers. And it started in John chapter 13. It's a continuous conversation. And uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half as they uh, leave the upper room where they had the Last Supper. They're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, in chapter 18 and verse 1, they're going to go into Gethsemane. And so he was talking to his followers, and now he's going to talk to his father. And we know that when he dies on the cross in just a little bit, uh, that one of the things going to happen is the veil is going to be ripped from the top to the bottom in the temple, and we're going to, we're going to, it's going to be opened up to the presence of God. And we get a little foreshadowing of that in John 17 because Jesus is praying to the Father and he lets the disciples listen in and it's recorded for us. And uh, so remember, the hour has come. The cross is waiting for its victim. Death is in the air. It's the hour of the cross and Jesus, and Jesus prays. Jesus prays. And so I, I'm going to have a word of prayer here. And we're going to look at this prayer of Jesus, John chapter 17. We, we were in it a couple of weeks ago. And I just want you to see in Jesus' prayer three things. I'll give you the outline right now. Uh, this would be a, a good uh, Sunday morning to take notes as we break this down a little bit. But let me give you the outline as we look at the prayer of Jesus. We should be encouraged about what he's praying for, uh, who he's praying for, and the passion with which he's praying. And so let me give you the outline. We're going to look at, in Jesus' prayer, the prominence of the world. He has a lot to say about the world uh, in his prayer. And then secondly, we're going to look at the position of the believer in his prayer. What What does he say about the believer in the world? And then thirdly, and we'll, we'll end with this, we're going to look at the personal requests that Jesus has to the Father for the believers that are in the world. So the prominence of the world, the position of the believer, and the personal requests for the believer in the world. Let me just have a word of prayer and ask God to bless our time uh, this morning. Father, thank you again for bringing us all together. Uh, Lord, I, the, the older I get, the more I love the fellowship of the brothers and sisters in Christ and just getting to see and uh, say hi to one another. And Lord, I know in our midst there are, there are blessings, there are burdens, there are hurts, there are, there are joys and everywhere in between. And only you, Lord, uh, could meet each person where they're at. And so, Lord, I pray that, uh, Father, that you would take this prayer that you sought to record of your son praying to you, that you would open up the window of the beauty of that prayer to us uh, here this morning. And uh, thank you for it in Christ's precious name. Amen. So the first thing we want to see in the prayer, and it's very prominent, is the uh, concept of the world, the prominence of the world in Jesus' prayer. If, if you were to go and underline every time uh, the word world is used in John chapter 17, depending on the version you're using, it would be 18 times in my, I think in my ESV if I counted right. Uh, so there's 26 verses and if you can imagine him having a 10 minute prayer to his father and 18 times he mentions the world, he, there's something on his soul as he's going to the cross about the world. Uh, The word world is used 219 times in Scripture. 
And so we want to know what, what, when he's praying about the world, Scripture speaks about the world, what, what is he talking about exactly? Well, the word world, as you probably have heard before, is the, in the original language is the word cosmos, or we get the words cosmetics or cosmetology. And it literally means to put in order or to arrange. Now, in Scripture, the word world is used three different ways. And it's going to be very important for how he's going to pray in this prayer request in a little bit for you to understand how Jesus is using the word world. So let me give you the three ways it's used in Scripture. Number one, uh, often, uh, or, or at least in a number of times when Scripture mentions the world, it's talking about the physical created world. I have Acts 17 up there, actually in Acts 17 and verse 24, here would be a sample of this use of the word world. God who made the world and everything in it. So it's talking about creation, it's talking about the trees, it's talking about the planet. So, so uh, a few times in scripture it's talking about the created uh, universe. Sometimes it's talking about the people that are in the physically created world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, verse 70, God didn't come into, Christ didn't come into the world to condemn the world. So he's talking about the people in the world. But far and away, the most dominant use of the word world, and it's dominant in Jesus' prayer here, is the third use of the world, word world, and that's talking about the values and the principles that dominate the world. It's talking about this arranged system of the world's values and thinking that is against God. It's against God. And it's led by Satan himself. And uh, we're here in 2023, and does Lakeside or Pastor Dave, you actually believe there's a Satan, there's a devil? And you, yes, absolutely. The scripture says there's. We don't like to think about it. It's kind of weird thinking about it, talking about it, and is that so? And yes, but scripture says yes, and he's the dominant mover of the world's thinking. I want you to nail that down in your mind as you're here today because we live in a part of the world that is beautiful and we have the riches of God and, and the world can be, we can think of it as a good place, not the world system. So let me give you just a couple of verses. You write down the references and get this nailed in your mind about the world system because this is predominantly how the word is used in Scripture. Paul said, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So, so, so the gospel light, it's like it's a darkness to people. Why don't they get it? In, the, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, he, so, there, so scripture talks about the God of this age. Well, let's just go a little bit further, and there's a number of these passages. I just, I'm giving you a sample. 1 John 5 and verse 19. The same author of the Gospel of John writes this letter, and we know that we are from God. He's writing to believers. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. All of the thinking of the culture of the world. Now, remember, sometimes Satan comes as an angel of light. So, it, so it's not as bad as it could be the world, but the dominant thinking and culture is against God and the whole world, according to Scripture, lies in the power of the evil one. And to be even more specific, Revelation 12 and verse 9, and Revelation's talking about the, the end time, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So he's alive and active uh, today. So the world system, the thinking of the world that is radically opposed to God. And I do believe in our country 
um, that as time goes on, if the Lord doesn't come back, that dominant thinking will press on us more and more and more and more. Let me uh, read a little snippet from an article that was written. The world is too big for us. Too much going on. Too many crimes. Too much violence. Try as you will, you get behind in the race in spite of yourself. It's an incessant strain to keep pace. And still you lose ground. Science empties its discoveries on you so fast that you stagger beneath them in hopeless bewilderment. The political world is news seen so rapidly you're out of breath trying to keep pace with who's in and who's out. Everything is high pressure. Human nature can't endure much more. That was from the Atlantic Journal, June 16th, 1833. 1833. Satan has been around for a long time. So we want to have an accurate understanding as followers of Christ, and if you're living here, of this system, this culture that we are within, and the pressure is coming from that way of thinking, and it's coming like a tidal wave over in us. If you don't understand uh, the, this position that you're in, which we're going to talk about in just a second, you're, you're, going, to get, you're going to get swallowed up uh, by the world. So that leads me uh, to just share this vo verse from, from John. Well, what are we to do? So the writer of the Gospel of John also wrote 1 John, said this, do not love the world. Now he's not saying don't love creation. Uh, we do ditch clean up twice a year. Uh, we, we try to keep our world beautiful, amen? We, we love the part of the world that we live in and we're thankful for God and we can see who God is by creation and we love the people in the world. The first two uses of that word. So he's not saying don't love people, don't love creation, don't, don't worry about littering. He's not saying that. He's talking about the world system. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, now notice how he's using it, world system, uh, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, what, what you see, what the world has to offer, the pride of life. It is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And be sure of this this morning. The world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Amen? Amen. So let's look at the, uh, the position of the believer uh, in Jesus' prayer. And it's going to be very instructive for us. Um, the position of the believer in Jesus' prayer. Now, I just want to start by saying, well, who is the believer? Because in our group here, there's going to be a mixed group. There's going to be some that claim the name of Christ and don't really know what that means. You were born into that. There's going to be ardent followers who have laid it all out on the line for Christ, who have, who have surrendered their life, and, uh, and everywhere in between. So who is, who is, the, who is the believer, uh, and what is their position in the world? And a couple of weeks ago, we used this definition. The believer is the person who, has, who personally knows God the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ and having trusted in his finished work on the cross is given eternal life. It's this group of people that have seen what Christ did on the cross, have seen the need for it and have applied it to their life. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. That, that would be the believer uh, that's in the word. Now, the follower of Jesus is not like following on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, it, it goes a little bit uh, past that. Uh, by the way, in, on Instagram, does anybody uh, know who has the most followers on Instagram? Is anybody up on that? Uh, it's, it, it, would, uh, it would not be the Kardashians. You'd be very close. They're, they're, the whole family's number two. Uh, but Cristiano Ronaldo, the soccer player, uh, he comes in at 539 million followers. A uh, Twitter, uh, you might be interested. Well, who's the, got the most followers on Twitter? Uh, that would be our, our very own Barack Obama. He comes in with a paltry 133 million followers. We're not to follow like you do on Instagram or Twitter. The believer is the person that, that has made a commitment with their life uh, to follow Christ uh, no matter the cost. Now notice 
Notice the position in the world. There's going to be four little terms that come right out of the prayer. They're just little two-word terms. And I want you to notice the tension as I give you these four little terms to describe the position of the believer in this world system that's opposed to God. Uh, number one, the, the believer is called out of the world, called out. If you look at verse 6 of John chapter 17, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Whom you gave me out of the world. Those who have followed me. Those, those who, have, when I said, when Jesus said, follow me, uh, they, 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 followed, they left everything and they followed him. They've been called out. I'm teaching a, a class in our equipping series on what is the church. The original word for church is the Greek word ekklesia. It's made up of two words, called out. The church are a group of people who have been called out. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 probably says it better than I can. If you're a follower of Christ, here's who God says you are. You're a chosen race, been chosen by God. You're a royal priesthood. You're royalty to God. You're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? Why would God do that? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of yourself? No. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, so number one, a believer, somebody's been called out. Now here comes the tension. The second phrase that Jesus uses in the prayer is, but you've been sent back in. Uh, look at uh, verse 18. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Well, wait a second. I've been called out of the world and Jesus sends me back into the world. This isn't so easy. I'm getting a little confused here, Lord. I need a little help. And Jesus said, Dave, why do you think I'm praying for you? You do need help. We're sent in. John 20, verse 21. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. The great commission that he gave to the disciples is, as you're going into the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. Paul, again, uh, said it better than I could say it. And listen to what he says about a believer being called out and sent back in. He says this, all this is from God, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 through 20, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us a ministry, and the ministry is of, say the word with me, reconciliation. Now, by the way, reconciliation is helping people be connected to God. That's our ministry. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. I embolden that. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The word ambassador means sent one. So we're called out. And we're sent back in. Oh, Lord, help me. And then, if that's not enough to cause tension, you're called out of the world, you're sent back in. Uh, he says over and over in Scripture, but you're not to be of the world. You're to be in the world, but you're not to be of the world. Look at verse 14 of John chapter 17. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Skip down to verse 16. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. He's saying, look, I called you out of the world. I'm sending you back in the world, but you're not to be of the world. You serve a different master. Your citizenship is now in heaven and now not on earth. 
You have a different destiny. Um, you, you're, there should be friction in your life because you're called out, you're sent in, you're not to be of it. A anybody here want to say they got this down pat, no, no problems? So the world then is a system built away from God and from it the believer is taken, called out, delivered, sent in and to, and to live the Christ life in the midst of that world. And if that isn't difficult enough, there's a fourth term and the final term to describe the position of the believer is that we're hated by the world. Now we don't sense that always. Matter of fact, maybe the world's been a kind place to you. Um, but, but that's not true throughout the world. And in the culture we live in is getting crazier and crazier. Look at verse 14 of John 7, chapter 17. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Go back to John chapter 15. This isn't the first time Jesus has said this in his last conversation. John 15 and verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now let me just stop right there and if you're taking notes, you circle the word hate. It's a very specific word. It doesn't mean just kind of grumble. It doesn't mean just kind of have an indifference. The actual word that Jesus chose right here is the word to pursue with hatred. It's got, a, it's got an activity to it. It's not a neutral hatred. It's a pursuing hatred. And I just want you to think with me about it. It's, the world is not neutral towards believers. Okay, so let's just take any cultural issue today that the scriptures would speak very clear about that is against what the world would teach today. They are not okay with, uh, okay, you do your thing and we'll do our thing. They want an endorsement on their thing. If you don't endorse what they're doing, they hate you. They'll come out and they'll spite you. I just read, uh, I, I went to a pastor's conference for numbers of years in uh, Jacksonville, uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And, uh, and uh, the, the pastor of that church, uh, Heath Lambert is his name. He's written a number of counseling books that we use. And uh, he came out uh, publicly. It's a, it's a huge church with a statement that he believes uh, marriage uh, is between a male and a female only. And uh, the entire city is boycotting him and they're picketing the church. And it's like this is a new uh, teaching that's been all he did. See, they want you to endorse them. They're, they're not just... Uh, they're not neutral in, okay, you believe that, we'll believe this, let's just be friends. No, 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 that's not how the world works. You will never get the victory as a follower of Christ unless you understand your position in the world. You're called out of it, you're sent back in it, you're not to be of it, and you're, uh, and you're hated by it. If you do not understand, as a follower of Christ, your uh, position in the world, You'll be like a wave, James says, of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind, a double-minded person, unstable in all your ways. So it's very important to know how Jesus prayed and how he saw us uh, here. Now that leads me to the last uh, 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 topic in his prayer, the last part of his prayer, the personal uh, request for the believer in Jesus' prayer. Now I want you to be encouraged this morning as we look at a, a couple of these requests, and we won't, be able to, we won't be able to cover them all. I want you to put your eyes on verse 20. Because when he was praying right before he went into the garden and a couple hours later to the cross, he was thinking about literally you and me. He says in verse 20 of these things that he's asking of the Lord, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. 
He's looking down through time at all those who would believe the gospel, trust in the finished work of Christ, all the way down through time, and he's praying for them. He's saying, I'm not just praying, Father, for these disciples right with me, for, but for all of those who will believe. That's, that's some of us here right now. You should be encouraged by that. Number two, when we look at these simple prayer requests, the other thing that should be encouraging to us is if, if he prayed for that right before he went to the cross, and he's in heaven today ever living to make intercession for us, then he's praying these things for us uh, today. Let me share a couple of them with you. Number one, Jesus is overwhelmed in his prayer as he's going to the cross. He should be thinking, it should be about him, but he's making it about everybody else. He, he prays for the protection of the believer. Look at verse 11. He, he says in verse 11, And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep, there's the word, them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. Verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction, that's Judas, that the scripture might be uh, fulfilled. Skip down to verse, uh, verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, Christ is praying from personal experience. For three years, he's had the world and the uh, ruler of the world nipping at his heels for three years, and they're going to they're gonna nail him to the cross. So he's praying that the believers are kept. Keep them, that they be kept. And even though it's a different word, it has the same meaning, the idea of guard. And here's a very special meaning to what he's praying the word keep or kept literally means to watch over by keeping an eye on. To watch over by keeping an eye on. Father, I'm asking you as I'm leaving, as I'm going to the cross, I, while, while they were on earth, I kept an eye on them. None of them have been lost. I've had to corral them. I've had to bring that Henri guy, Peter, back into the fold a couple of times and they shoot off on me and I go get them. I keep an eye on them like a shepherd with a sheep. Father, I'm, I'm, I'm going away. I'm asking you to keep an eye on him. Do you know one of God's prominent names in the Old Testament? Uh, and Hagar came up with this, and she didn't think anybody cared about her. And she named God El Roy, the God who sees. Jesus is saying, Father, you're the God who sees. I need you to keep an eye on these disciples and everybody who's going to believe, because it's a rough old world out there. That's why Jesus could say in Luke chapter 12 and verse 7, even the hairs of their head are numbered. That's easier for some of us, for God to do that, than others. <laughs> Psalm 121, the psalmist got it. And these verses are all over Scripture. This idea of God keeping an eye on us. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Verse 8, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Are we thankful he's keeping an eye on us? I am. Very thankful. Uh, number two, he prayed for the believer's sanctification. And that's a big uh, $1,000 uh, seminary word. And I'd like to just break it down, but I want to show you that it, that it is a biblical word in Scripture. If you look at John chapter 17 and verse 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Verse 19, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Uh, the word sanctification, the word sanctified, the same word consecrate, it's the same exact word, it means to set apart. It means to, to put a circle around, to give them a purpose to consecrate them, to have them be special. And so, so I just want you to see this, and this could be a whole series. But he's praying for us to be set apart. We're not to, he's not praying that we get taken out of the world. One of the only prayers prayed in the Old Testament by saints that never got answered or didn't get answered was when Moses and Elijah and there was one other person prayed to be taken out of the world. God didn't answer that. 
God's answer is not to take us out of the world, it's to send us into the world. So we need the keeping, uh, consecrating work of God in our lives. So let me just give you four truths about sanctification. You write it down and this is, this is worthy of more time uh, than I'm going to give it. So he says in verse 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. Set them apart. It's a work of God in us. When God cleans us up, he doesn't say, Dave, get a pair of dress pants. Dave, could you put a tie on? Hey, some churches, Dave, the, the main guy up there, he wears a collar. That, no, sanctification is an inside heart job. It's a work of God in us. Uh, number two, sanctification is a progressive work of God in us. We never arrive in this lifetime, amen? Amen. Basically, if you wanted to bring it down the simplest term, sanctification is making us more like Christ. Right before the first service, a mom with her very young little daughter said, Pastor, I need you to talk to my daughter. I'm like, okay, well, what's going on? Well, she has the idea that the pastor never sins. So I wanted to say, pound it right there. I said, no, your, your pastor sins, and I don't know if she was getting it. I said, well, uh, talk to my wife when she gets here. She'll tell you all about it. <laughs> it's a progressive work. We never arrive. It's like, I want to be like Christ. And Paul said, the things I don't want to do, I do. The things I do want to do, I don't. And so it's this progressive work of God in our lives, changing us to be more like Christ. Christ is praying for that for you and me today. Two more ideas under sanctification. It's a twofold process, sanctification is. It's to be set apart from the world in sin and then consecrated or set apart to God. So it's from something and it's to something. You can't take either side of the equation and just have it be that. You're set apart from the world in sin, the world system, and you're set apart to God. And according to John 17 and verse 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. The primary way that God does that is through his word that he's given us. And John 17 and verse 17 says it's absolute truth. So at Lakeside Fellowship, we believe unashamedly that this is absolute truth, amen? amen. Whatever this says about marriage, we say about marriage. Whatever this says about sin, we say about sin. Whatever this says about loving our neighbor, uh, we love our neighbor. Amen? This is what it is right here. I, I always want some, and I realize you have devices. I use, during the week, I use my phone. I, I got the Bible in there. I get that. I, I like to see a Bible, uh, not because the, this leather is more special uh, than that, but I, I want everybody to have the visual. This is the truth, Amen? I lived a big part of my life being told what to believe and never told why. And then I found out there was no foundation to what I was told. It's absolute truth. And you know the truth of the matter is for the world system, the only absolute for the world system is there's no absolute truth. That's exactly how the world thinks, no absolute, everybody does what's right in their own mind, and we as believers are given absolute truth. We don't get to decide uh, what we think is right or wrong in any situation. J. Wilbur Chapman said this, it's not the ship in the water, but water, the water in the ship that sinks it. It's not the Christian in the world, but the world in the Christian that constitutes the danger and so, so just before I share the third thing that Christ prayed for, and then I wrap this up, I want us to think as followers of Christ about what would worldliness or the world that we're to be not of or separated from, what would, what would worldliness in our life look like? And I'm just going to give you these three kind of indicators that there's some worldliness in your life. Uh, number one, the appetites of the flesh control you. You, you, you find you're constantly dominated by the lusts of the flesh. Uh, number two, 
your, your general thinking, uh, how, how you spend your money, what, what motivates, you're living in the present. You, you, you have this idea, you don't want to miss out on what this life has to offer. You don't want your kids to miss out on what this life has to offer. You're denying getting older. And then number three, the third sign of worldliness, and I'm just taking this probably from my own life, you're ruled by the opinions of others rather than God's word. Now, last night I was, uh, as I got done, I was, uh, I came in here and I, I, I was walking around the gym. It was late at night, so it was dark, and I was kind of debating, should I turn the light on in here or should I just walk walk around in the darkness and there was a little bit of light coming through one of the windows and and it was from my office it was bright I walked in here and the first couple of laps I as I was walking around here praying and I'm not telling you that because I was praying but I just want to use this as an illustration it was kind of really dark in here but you know the longer I walked in the darkness the easier it was to see in the darkness so I'm just kind of wondering for my own life how long since it's really been since you really walked in the light is the dark really dark to you does the darkness seem dark? He, he wants to change us. Now I close with this. So what do we do? What is God asking from us collectively and individually? Well, we're not to isolate like the monks. We're not to insulate like the Pharisees. Don't touch the people in the world. Don't look at them. Don't make eye contact. Walk on the other side of the street. Jesus was mocked for having friends in the world. We're not to vegetate like an apathetic believer. It's like, well, the world is what it is. It's going to go to hell in a handbasket and, you know, whatever it is. We're not to imitate. We're going to be just as hip as the world. We'll win them that way. The, the, the word is permeate. Permeate. We're to be in the world but not of the world. As someone has famously said, like a ship in the sea moving in the midst of evil but untouched thereby. We're to go into the world and help lead the lost out of the darkness and into the light. Paul wrote in Philippians 2 and verse 15 that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That, that's, that's, God's, that's God's plan. I, I want to take the hill for Christ, amen? I, I want lakeside in my own life. I, I want to permeate my family, my neighborhood, uh, my community, our school district, uh, our state. Our co- we we want to permeate, amen? We're not going to isolate. I, I read a little ditty of a poem and it caught my fancy. Uh, There was a very cautious man who never laughed nor played. He never risked, he never tried, he never sang nor prayed. And when one day he passed away, his insurance was denied. Since he never lived, they said, he really never died. I want to live for Christ. Amen? I want to live for Christ. So here's Vance Havner, and I close with this. We're not going to win the world by criticism of it. Or conformity to it, but by combustion within it, ignited by the Spirit of God. Let's be the church. Let me pray. Father, thanks. Lord, in my spirit and just just being reasonable says that in the room today and you know, somebody online, they don't really have a relationship with you. And yet they're here. In, in your sovereignty, uh, they're here. Lord, I pray that they would see the beauty of trusting in your son's finished work on the cross. The beauty of having sins forgiven. The beauty of having the abundant life and eternal life given. The beauty of having a purpose in this crazy world. Lord, I pray for Lakeside Fellowship and the the group of authentic believers who are called the church, the called out ones. Uh, Lord, you prayed about it. You're still praying about it. You know how difficult it is down here to be called out, sent in, not to be of it, hated by it. Lord, we're so prone to wander. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would do this special sanctifying work in our individual lives 
and in the community of believers called Lakeside Fellowship. Might, might, we, might we make a difference in this world? And in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, might we be lights in a very dark world? Well, thank you for it. In Christ's precious name, amen.